All right. Um, well, I want to thank uh, AWS for your partnership and for enabling amazing science uh, and discoveries. I want to um, thank all of you for being here today. I want to thank my partner, Dean Jayathi Murthy, for the, for the um, willingness to embark on what I think is such an important area. And I want to uh, thank Eliezer also. I like the frenetic leadership. I think that's going to stick. Um, and also for inviting me to talk about uh, my science and, uh, and to tell you about the research that's done in my lab. And this is research that I realized as I thought about it uh, last night and this morning <laughs> is, um, uh, you know, research that's done from the perspective of a molecular neurobiologist. And I think it's appropriate to start the day this way because it's a, it's a field of, that, of, of science that I think will benefit enormously by the insights of others who approach it with a more computational um, perspective. So in my lab, we're interested in understanding how experience changes the connections between neurons in the brain to store long-term memories. And this is a problem that's really sort of uh, critical to who we are as human beings. We're born with a wired brain. That brain then, the wiring of that brain changes with experience. And through that way, our experiences <coughs> change how we perceive, how we think, how we feel, how we imagine. Um, and how we behave. And it's a, it's a problem that's been of interest for many, many uh, centuries. And over a century ago, Ramon y Cajal, literally sitting at his kitchen table uh, with a microscope and using a staining method that was developed by um, uh, Golgi, Camilo Golgi, um, was able to look and understand that the brain is composed of distinct discrete cells, and these are nerve cells or neurons, that um, have these uh, these sort of spots here, which are the sites where the neurons communicate with one another. And just by looking at this structure, um, he hypothesized that the cerebral cortex is like a garden full of innumerable trees, the pyramidal cells, a type of neuron, which in response to intelligent cultivation, the lectures you're going to hear after my lecture, um, can increase the number of their branches strike their roots over a wider area and produce ever more varied and more exquisite fruits and f flowers and fruits. And so this idea really, again, just from looking at that data, the images that he was able to l see looking at stained pigeon brains, came up with the idea that perhaps as we learn, there's an increase in the number of these branches or in the increase in the number of these flowers, the sites of contact between individual neurons. So um, this idea of experience-dependent synaptic plasticity or remodeling of connections between neurons uh, with all the modern techniques that are available to us is a really um, difficult and computationally complex problem to solve. If you look at the three-pound human brain here, it has about 80, 86 billion nerve cells. They form about 100 trillion synapses. And so trying to understand how does experience change the connections between those becomes a rather difficult um, problem. And uh, what I've undertaken in my career is really what I consider to be a cell biologist view of how long-term memories are stored. And I take as a starting point the finding from many decades of studies in animals that long-term memory and long-term plasticity, these changes in connectivity, require new gene expression. And so if you look in a neuron, this is a, a neuron in the brain, a neuron in a culture dish of cells, you need new gene expression, you need the synthesis of RNA from DNA, and you need the synthesis of protein from uh, RNA. And in addition to that requirement for new gene expression, there are lots of findings that show that um, this long-lasting form of learning a related plasticity can be synapse-specific. So if you have a single neuron here, there can be changes that happen at some of the synapses that are formed by that neuron and not at others. And so this is really a question of how does stimulation, how does activity change gene expression in a cell? And we know a lot from molecular cell biology about this process. We know that 
When a cell received a signal or a ligand at a receptor on the cell surface, it's transduced through the cytoplasm of the cell to the nucleus. It then turns on gene ex uh, transcription in the nucleus. RNAs are made and processed in the nucleus. They're then transported out into the cytoplasm. They can be localized in the cytoplasm. Um, the RNA, the translation into protein can be regulated. Uh, the protein can undergo post-translation modifications that alter its, its structure and function. And then, of course, the stability of both the RNA and the protein can be regulated. So if you're saying, well, how is gene expression regulated during long-term memory? You have to think about all of those steps. Where is it regulated? And in my lab, we've really, th those questions are really challenging in a neuron because what we know about from a textbook sort of example, a cell like this or a lymphocyte over here is a little bit simpler. You have kind of a ball with the nucleus and you have to get a signal from the plasma membrane into the nucleus, send an RNA somewhere in that cytoplasm. But in a neuron, and here is a Purkinje neuron that's in the cerebellum, you can see that if the signal's received way out distally, um, and I'm not finding my, uh, let's see, my mouse here, but if a neuron, if a signal's received really distally in a distal synapse, it's got to travel a really long way back to this cell body where the nucleus is. And if you're going to have a change in structure and function that's going to happen, say, just at this group of synapses, then somehow whatever genes are being changed have to be spatially restricted in their <coughs> um, function to a small uh, subset of that neuronal arbor. And so we've taken those two discrete questions as starting points for trying to understand at a very reduction of cell biological level how memories are stored. And so we ask how are signals transported from a synapse back to the nucleus to regulate transcription? And then how is gene expression spatially regulated at subsets of synapses so that it can alter the structure and function of specific synapses to um, produce long-lasting memories? And in my lab, we've used two model systems for asking these questions. One is an invertebrate system and one is a, uh, is a vertebrate system. The invertebrate system is a sea slug that's native to California. Uh, called Aplesia californica, it's shown here. And the advantages of working in, in Aplesia are that it has a relatively simple nervous system. So I said humans have about 86 billion neurons. Uh, Aplesia has about 10,000 neurons. So you've, you've reduced the complexity. And then as a cell biologist, uh, what's really important is they're very large and identifiable. So if you open up, it doesn't have a centralized brain the way that mammalians do, but it has distributed ganglia, and the neurons have very specific sizes, shapes, locations, pigmentation, and so you can recognize them. I know that this is um, L1, I can see L7 uh, over here, and they're large neurons. They can be between 100 microns and 1 millimeter in diameter, so it's very easy to take an electrode and poke it into one of those neurons and record from it. And then importantly, it's a simple <coughs> animal, but it has some modifiable behavior, so behaviors where it shows learning. So for example, if in the animal you um, touch the siphon of the animal, it will withdraw its gill. And if you uh, sensitize that by giving a tail shock, when you now touch the siphon, it has a very enhanced gill withdrawal. It's, it's uh, more robust and it lasts for longer. If you give a single tail shock, that's a very short-term memory or short-term sensitization. <coughs> if you give multiple tail shocks, that's a very long-lasting fear type of memory. Well, because we can record from neurons, we can determine what the circuitry that underlies that memory is, and we can actually put them in a dish, just those very few cells that are involved, a sensory neuron from the siphon, a motor neuron to the gill that causes that gill withdrawal, and then this, the serotonergic neuron that is activated by the tail shock that then leads to an enhanced re, uh, communication between the sensory and the motor neuron. And so we can put them all together in a dish, or we can just put the sensory and the motor neuron in a dish. We can put electrodes in and record how strong their synaptic connection is. And then we can use a pipette to just apply serotonin to the dish. And you see immediately that when you apply serotonin, you get a strengthening of the of the synaptic strength between the sensory and the motor neuron, 
correlates to the increase in the with gill withdrawal. If you give one application of serotonin, short-term increase in strength, multiple applications, a very long-lasting increase in strength. So here we have a system where we can say, what changes in genes happen when you go from that short-term to the long-term? And we can further take those cells and unlike mammalian neurons, we can actually chop off their cell bodies with the pipette and we're left with all this, the neuronal processes. They still connect with one another. We can use an electrode to record from them and we can monitor the strength of their connections. And so we can dissect out what's happening locally from what's happening in the cell body in the nucleus. And then further, in that culture dish, we can take a sensory neuron by itself and it doesn't make any synapses with any other partner and we can add an appropriate postsynaptic partner and it will make a synapse. If you add a neuron it normally doesn't synapse with, it'll fasciculate along that neuron, but it won't make a chemical synapse. So we can use this very simple preparation to ask about how is gene expression regulated when you make a synapse and when you strengthen a synapse. And then the second um, system that we use is um, from the mouse and the advantages of working in mouse is that there's incredible genetic tools. Um, and, uh, and they are, have a brain structure that's much more similar to a human brain structure. And we work in a region of the mouse brain called the hippocampus. And the hippocampus has been shown um, in animal experimental studies, but also in human clinical studies to be a region of the brain that's critical for spatial and other forms of what's called explicit memory. And it's a beautiful system for an electrophysiologist because when you look at the structure of the hippocampus, it has these three um, uh, pathways where you can see in the green there's a, there's a neuron from the dentate gyrus that connects to neurons from CA3 and, then a pa and there's another earlier one from entorhinal cortex. And then in red, the pathway between CA3 and CA1 neurons called the Schaefer collateral pathway. And we can, because of that, the way it's organized spatially, we can put electrodes in and stimulate those CA3 neurons and record from the CA1 neurons. And if you stimulate it at a high um, frequency and strength, you can get uh, a strengthening of that connection. And that strengthening has been shown to uh, correlate with long-lasting forms of memory. So uh, this kind of strengthening is called long-term potentiation, or LTP. And we can show that with some stimuli, weak stimuli, you get an increase in synaptic strength, but it doesn't last very long and it doesn't require any new genes. With, with strong stimuli, multiple strong stimuli, you get a very long lasting increase in synaptic strength and that does require the new express expression of new genes. So as a, um, a neurobiologist, we can take the neurons from the hippocampus, we can plate them in a culture dish where we can have access to uh, you know, an individual or, or, or circuits of neurons where you can see the nucleus here in, in um, blue uh, where the DNA is, but you can also um, see all of the synapses shown here in green so that you can really try to understand what's happening in different spatial locales of that individual neuron. Or we can make slices from the hippocampus where again you have that beautiful uh, um, layout with the dentate gyrus, CA3 and CA1, and we can use electrophysiology to ask how those populations of neurons connect with one another and how we can stimulate them to get long-lasting synaptic strengthening and, and look at the changes in gene expression that occur and that uh, are both uh, in parallel with but that are also required for that, those changes in synaptic strength. So the first question, how do signals get from stimulated synapses to the nucleus? So we know in neurons that if you have a neuron here and way out yonder at a synapse, you have a stimulus that's ar that arrives, that neurons are specialized for rapid communication. Through electrochemical signaling, you get an action potential and then that very rapidly is relayed through a calcium dependent manner to the nucleus. But we also know that when there's synaptic stimulation, you can activate signaling molecules, soluble signaling molecules that have to travel a very long distance through the, the neuronal process back to the soma and into the nucleus where they will um, uh, uh, activate transcription of target genes. And so my lab has been interested in this latter question of what's the pathway that's required for that retrograde transport. And in one um, study that was conducted by a postdoc, To Yan Ching, who now has his own lab in Singapore, uh, we focused on a transcription factor 
that we knew um, was uh, important for uh, what's called CREB-dependent transcription. So um, transcription from the uh, um, uh, cyclic AMP response element. Um, and this is a, a transcription factor that had been studied in non-neuronal cells and that was shown to really potently activate CREB-dependent transcription. And the way that it worked in non-neuronal cells was that it was anchored out in the cytoplasm. It was phosphorylated and bound to uh, anchoring proteins, so 1433 proteins, scaffolding proteins. And if a signal came into the neuron that elevated calcium, that activated phosphatases that led to the dephosphorylation, whereas the cyclic AMP inactivated the kinases that usually phosphorylated CRTC. And that dephosphorylated CRTC traveled into the nucleus bound to CREB and promoted CREB-dependent transcription by about 1,500-fold. So we knew from, again, decades of work that long-lasting forms of memory and plasticity require CREB-dependent transcription. And so we wanted to ask, could this molecule be um, a molecule whose transport from the synapse to the nucleus might couple stimulation with critical transcription in the nucleus? And so what Toyen did is he asked first, where is it localized? So he took those hippocampal slices and he looked using antibodies that are shown here in green to see CRTC1 um, in a hippocampal slice preparation. And if you look in the dotted white lines at higher magnification, you can see the neurons in the CA1 region. And you can see the green is all out in those dendrites in the neuronal processes. But in the sort of black holes, which are the nuclei, there's no CRTC1. But if we stimulate to get long-lasting potentiation, it all travels into the nucleus where it can actually function as a transcriptional regulator. Or if we look in culture where we can get better resolution at a subcellular level, we could show in green that CRTC1 is localized at these synaptic, postsynaptic spines um, and in the dendrite in, in silent cells and then travels back to the nucleus. So we've been asking, how does that stimulation trigger the translocation? What's the impact on transcription? And how does that impact uh, learning and memory and plasticity? So I showed you those pictures. Those are all static pictures, before and after stimulation. So you get accumulation in the nucleus, but you don't really know that it traveled there. So we have to show that it actually travels there. And the way that we do that is we make constructs where we take CRTC1 and we fuse it to a photoconvertible fluorescent protein here at Dendra2. So Dendra2 is a fluorophore that normally fluoresces green. If you give a really brief UV light, it changes to red. And so we can express that using viruses in neurons. And so it's all green. But then if we use a UV light just in one location at a distal uh, set of synapses, it will, that will turn red. And then we can do another trick, which is that we can put glutamate, which is the neurotransmitter that's activating these synapses. And we can use a ca chemically caged form of glutamate that's in the media that's also uncaged or activated by that UV light. And so we give that brief UV light. We're both photoconverting and we're stimulating those synapses. And we can ask, can we visualize that um, transport back to the nucleus? And what we find is if we look in a neuron that only has green, no red, because we haven't photoconverted, we go out about 200 microns from the cell soma. We photoconvert from green to red. We don't photoconvert all. There's still some green. And then we, and it's stimulating because we're activating, we're uncaging glutamate. And then we use a confocal to image through the cell body and in the nucleus. And you can see at the zero time point, you can see the, the, um, the nucleus, there's no CRTC. You can see it in the somatic cytoplasm. There's no red signal. But over a period here, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, you've now seen that CRTC photoactivated travel into the nucleus. So that shows us that it's indeed traveling all the way back. And we can use this kind of an assay to ask lots of questions about how does that happen. So just as an example, we can show in the red, you can see the time course of how that photoconverted stim uh, stimulated CRTC is, is arriving in the nucleus. We can show here if we block two types of, of glutamate receptors, AMPA and NMDA receptors, that blocks the translocation. And we've used other approaches to figure out what are the motor proteins that make it travel along the side of skeleton, which type of side of skeleton, uh, where does it need to get dephosphorylated, and questions like that, just using this simple assay. So another really interesting finding that we had looking at CRTC1 
is that if we looked at it biochemically, we noticed that it really changed massively in its molecular weight when we stimulated it. So we looked at the primary sequence and we noticed that it was enriched for serines, threonines, and tyrosines and thought, well, it, it, you know, like we knew that you needed dephosphorylation at two residues to get it to go, and we thought, well, maybe there's more uh, regulated activity-dependent regulated phosphorylation or dephosphorylation. So we did two-dimensional gels where you look in, in this dimension at the molecular weight and in this dimension at the isoelectric point. And what we found is that in silence neurons, in green as shown CRTC1, you see that it's high molecular weight and towards the acidic or the phosphorylated isoelectric point. If we stimulate for 10 minutes, we see a really a drop in molecular weight and also a profound movement towards the basic or dephosphorylated um, isoelectric point. And if we take our sample and we just put phosphatases in it to just cleave off all the phosphate groups in the lysate, it drops way down. So that tells us that there's a really a lot of change, a lot of residues that are undergoing changes in phosphorylation. And so we then went on with a, a graduate student, Martina Sal De Salvo, um, to begin to map what some of those phosphorylation sites are. And we did this using mass spectrometry with the lab of James Walschlegel here at UCLA. And we've, we identified 60, uh, 50 different sites that are highly conserved from aplesia and worms through humans that undergo these changes in phosphorylation. So we thought, oh, initially we'd be able to try to get at some sort of code, but 50 is an awful lot for an experimentalist to begin to tease apart. We've made mutations in the ones that are 100% conserved, shown here in the boxes, and we've shown that those are actually the sites where the where the actual stimulus-dependent nuclear translocation occurs, but we have many other sites that we're really interested in trying to understand. And we have a hypothesis that we're exploring that it might be that different types of synaptic signals might lead to different patterns of post-translational modification, and that might then lead to having CRTC1 couple with different um, either transcription factors or with CREB at different um, promoter elements, and that in that way you might get coupling between specific uh, synaptic signals with specific programs of gene expression. And consistent with the idea that that might be happening, uh, Jenny Akiro, a, a postdoc in my lab, has been um, doing electrophysiology and hippocampal slices, and what she's found is if she induces long-term potentiation, using two different stimuli, or if she induces a different type of plasticity called long-term depression, which is an activity-dependent weakening of synaptic strength that also requires gene expression. In all those cases, she sees translocation of CRTC1 into the nucleus. And we can also show that these cases, and this is the work of a graduate student, Siobhan Bonanno, that um, both with LTD and with LTP, you get dephosphorylation. So we can look, for example, using antibodies we've made that see specifically one site, the serine 151, and see if it's phosphorylated. So you can see in the untreated, there's a strong band. In the depressed or LTP, there's no band. Or if you look at the total, you can see that drop in molecular weight, consistent with it being dephosphorylated. So to try to understand more about how, what's happening, we've undertaken um, a very large uh, um, uh, uh, chromatin immunoprecipitation sequencing study or CHIP-seq stu um, study where we are um, looking to see, to identify all the elements that CRTC1 binds to in the genome in the CA1 region after induction of either LTP or LTD uh, in hippocampal slices to see what those differences are and we're in the midst of analyzing all of that data. So to um, summarize uh, quickly here, what we've shown is that when we have stimulation at one synaptic site, you have CRTC1 sitting in a phosphorylated state at the synapse. It gets dephosphorylated. It travels back to the nucleus. We know a lot about the cell biology of how it travels back. It binds to specific um, uh, promoter elements, and that leads to expression of uh, activity-dependent transcripts. Um, 
we're interested in looking uh, at, and then it gets rephosphorylated and leave, leaves the nucleus. We're interested in trying to understand how that regulates gene expression. We've made a conditional knockout of CRTC1 so we can understand the impact on behavior and plasticity. And then in a final really interesting study, Jennifer Akiro is looking at that process where it gets rephosphorylated and leaves, and it turns out that that's dependent on cyclic AMP levels. And what's interesting about that is that neuromodulators like dopamine or norepinephrine, when, they're in, when, when you get stimulation, it stays in the nucleus for a longer period of time because they elevate cyclic AMP and they keep it in the nucleus. For us, that's interesting because there's a lot of literature in psychology showing that uh, arousal and release of dopamine and norepinephrine can enhance the formation of long-term memories. And so we're interested in trying to tease that apart using this system. So in the last um, seven minutes, which I think I have, I'm going to um, turn, turn directions to really asking, OK, so now you've made all of these activity-dependent uh, transcripts. How is it that they can function to just change strength, structure, and function? the proteome, the content of proteins at a particular synapse or a neighborhood of synapses. And this is something that I was interested in when I was a postdoc many years ago at Columbia in New York. And I realized in aplesia, I could ask that question. And I could ask that question or explore that question experimentally by taking an aplesia sensory neuron that had a bifurcated process. So here you see the sensory neuron. It's got two axons, and they're making and they're about a millimeter apart, so that's a long distance. And they make stable synaptic connections, put an electrode in the sensory neuron, stimulate it, record from the motor neurons, get a stable uh, uh, excitatory postsynaptic potential. But if you apply serotonin, and if you give one pulse of serotonin, you get an increase in synaptic strength here. It doesn't last, don't need any gene expression. But if you give repeated applications of serotonin, you get Increased synaptic strength here, no change over here, and it requires transcription in the sensory neuron nucleus. Um, and that actually doesn't occur by depolarization. It occurs by a signal traveling back. Um, but we also found that it, it required translation of RNAs that were localized in that distal process. So <coughs> in the past, I'm embarrassed to say how many years, 18 years, <laughs> we've done a lot of work to identify the RNAs that are localized, both in aplesia neurons, but also in mouse hippocampal neurons. And we've, together with other labs, Aaron Schumann's lab um, and many others, identified hundreds to thousands of localized mRNAs. Uh, we've done work looking at the mechanisms of mRNA localization. What are the elements in the, um, the cis-acting elements in the RNA sequence that are required to target that RNA out to the dendrite and the synapse? What are the RNA binding proteins that bind to those elements that target them to the synapses? And how is their translation regulated in response to synaptic stimulation? And in one um, set of experiments done by a student, Song Mok Kim, he asked uh, if we take this kind of a bifurcated sensory neuron, is there targeting of the RNA to a specific synapse or to a stimulated synapse? And so he took this and he did staining for a variety of different RNAs. And what he found is that RNAs localize everywhere. But what he then looked at is, where does the translation happen? And he found that translation only happens at a stimulated synapse. Or if you use a preparation in which you pair that sensory neuron with a neuron it will make a chemical synapse with, a neuron it won't make a chemical synapse with, RNA goes everywhere but you only get translation at the at chemical synapse. So what that really taught us in this pretty simple preparation is that there's sort of an uncoupling between the transcriptional, the activity-dependent transcription and the activity-dependent translation. And that transcription, activity-dependent transcription in the nucleus really sets the whole neuron in sort of a state of readiness so that if a stimulus comes in at a synapse, it can then um, translate those RNAs in response to local, local cues and stimuli. And so we've been working a lot on how that happens, but I wanted to just finish by, by moving a little bit. All of what I've told you about is very basic cell biology of gene regulated gene expression in neurons during synaptic plasticity. 
does this have any relevance to, um, to human brain function or human disease? And so I want to really briefly tell you about one study uh, where we've looked at uh, mutations in an RNA binding protein called RBFOX1, also known as A2BP, which um, we were interested in for a variety of reasons. I told you that when we looked at the mechanisms that localize an RNA, we identified RNA elements and also the RNA binding proteins that bind to those elements. And there's been a lot of beautiful computational work um, done on RBFOX1 that identifies the, the sequence that RBFOX1 binds to in RNAs, and that, that allowed us to bioinformatically identify potential targets. And what we noticed is many of those targets had RBFOX binding sites in their three prime untranslated region. So they looked like they were potential targets for regulation in the cytoplasm. And we were interested because um, mutations in uh, RBFOX1 and actually mutations in many RNA binding proteins have been uh, identified in neurologic diseases. In the case of RBFOX1, they've been identified in patients with epilepsy and with autism spectrum disorders and with intellectual disability. And so uh, what was interesting for us as cell biologists is that when we looked at RBFOX1, it exists in two forms. One form that's in the nucleus, but another form that's spliced and that's in the cytoplasm. And we could separate those two forms. So here what we've done is we've knocked out RBFOX1 and then re-expressed the, the spliced variant of RBFOX1 that's only in the cytoplasm here. So you can see here in red, it's just in the somatic cytoplasm and out in the dendrites, or, or just the nuclear form. So you can see here in red that it's just in the nucleus. And then we use these experiments to ask, um, what are the changes in the transcriptome if you have, if you knock it out and then you rescue with either the cytoplasmic or the nuclear isoform? And we also then did uh, cross-linking immunoprecipitation to ask, what does that cytoplasm, what RNAs does that cytoplasmic uh, um, RBFOX bind to and what does the nuclear RBFOX bind to? And I'm just going to skip to the skip the chase and tell you that what we found is that, not surprisingly, the nuclear RBFOX1 is involved in splicing. It binds to elements in intronic ele uh, regions of RNAs. Uh, the RBFOX1, cytoplasmic RBFOX1, binds to binding sites in the three prime UTR. We were able to show that one of the mechanisms by which what it does here is it actually promotes stability and translation of its target RNAs. And one of the ways that it does so is that it competes with binding of um, specific microRNAs. So the microRNAs will bind, they'll lead to degradation or repression of translation, but when RBFOX1 binds in the cytoplasm, it promotes the stability, it prevents the microRNA from binding, promotes the stability and promotes translation. And interestingly, when we identified those cytoplasmic targets of RBFOX1 and worked with the lab of Dan Geshwin, we found that they were highly enriched for transcripts that are um, associated with autism spectrum disorders. So again, these studies, uh, again, very cell biological, really underscore the importance of looking at post-transcriptional regulation in the cytoplasm and of thinking as we try to understand how gene regulation, um, uh, gene expression is regulated during plasticity of also considering that sort of spatial component so that you're not just looking at changes that occur in a large population, but changes that occur in the cell body and in the nucleus and changes that occur very locally at the synapse. So um, I want to thank all the people who've done this work. This is my current lab. And so some of the people I've talked about their work include um, uh, Jenny Achiro and, and Siobhan Bonanno. Uh, but everybody in the lab contributes to each other's experiments. And I want to thank many of my colleagues. One of the really wonderful things about being at UCLA, and I think it's evident from the fact that the School of Medicine and the School of Engineering are partnering to create a department, is that it's an incredibly collaborative place. It's very easy to work with colleagues across the campus. So a lot of the work I've done today um, has been done with Tom O'Dell for some of the hippocampal physiology, James Wolschlegel for the mass spec. The work on RBFOX1 has been a collaboration with the lab of Doug Black. Um, and and the, some of the analysis of RBFOX targets are collaboration with Dan Geshwin and my funding sources from NIMH and NINDS, and I'm happy to answer any questions.